reference to the kernel, like the TTY, serial, the driver core, and a bunch of other stuff. I can't remember. Um, I've been a kernel developer for a long time, um, and this talk is the first part of this talk is going to be about how we do kernel development, how we um, how the process works, and the second part's a uh, tutorial on how you can contribute, right? First patch. Um, as part of that. Um, if you have the Linux git tree, um, that's Linux Next, which is ideal to have for development. But I copied Linux's um, tree right here. So if you have git, please pass this around during the first part and copy it. So um, it needs Linux to actually mount this. That's the first thing. <laughs> um, if you want to pass this around. So just clone the tree. Uh, make sure it's cloned and not linked to the, this, otherwise it won't work. Okay, so um, please ask questions, interrupt, heckle, make fun. Um, I've been giving this talk for about 10 years now. Um, it's a long time, but things keep changing over time, so I update the numbers. But it's um, something I'm really used to. And I give it to a lot of universities uh, um, all around the world. So, first off, the kernel. Um, we just did a new release a couple weeks ago, 319. And I'll talk about how we do our numbering system later, but this is the size of it. We finally made 19 million lines of code. Um, you don't run all 19 million lines of code, of course. My laptop, I guessed, and it runs 1.3 million lines of code. 1.6. So um, you run the core, core part of the kernel, about 5% of that. Everybody runs that. Networking is like 20%. Drivers is 50%. Architecture specific stuff is 40. Um, but it's all, everybody runs a core, and then you run just the piece parts you need. So again, I run 1.3 and 1.6 on your laptop. But 19 million lines total, which is a lot, because we include all the drivers, all the architectures, everything. So this is uh, last year, so all the numbers I'm going to give is from our 3.14 to 3.19 release, which was January, pretty much all 2014, plus a month in 2015. Um, this is the size of what we have. So um, it's the largest software project ever. Most number of people, most number of companies, fastest, um, largest software project ever. And to do this stuff, um, we've actually created something that nobody else ever has, which is um, an operating <coughs> system that runs on all hardware for all machines and using the same code base, which is something really unique. So we've done so in a different way. But here's the rate of change, and this is something that a lot of people don't really realize what the kernel has. This is our rate of change. It doesn't look so bad for last year. So you realize the unit. <laughs> um, this is an operating system that's supposed to be stable. The world runs on this stuff. All air traffic control in Europe runs on this. All banking runs on this. All the stock exchanges run on it. The trains in, in lots of countries, like all of Japan runs on this. Nuclear power plants run on this. Phone systems, so you're networking. Um, we change a lot, an awful lot. And we've been changing for years. We keep getting faster. Um, the Linux Foundation told me to stop saying the word scary, um, but this is scary. <laughs> 24 hours a day, seven days a week last year, we did eight changes an hour. Um, six, no, eight years ago, we were running at two changes an hour, and I thought that was un unsustainable. Every single year, we keep going faster. Um, every year, I keep saying, there's no way we can possibly go faster, and we do. So I'm wrong all the time. Um, the 316 release was our fastest ever. That was a couple, that was the middle of last year. Um, that's a lot. So what this means is we're changing a lot. So an operating system, traditionally, you think of software as stable. You get it, you work, it works, you never change it again, right? You never want to touch it again. That works fine if your environment never changes. But the world changes. It constantly changes. So we aren't making changes to Linux just because we feel like it. We're making it because we have to. So if your operating system does not change, it's dead. It's that simple because the world changes. So if you look at some operating systems that move very, very slowly, or not at all, they're end of life. They're no longer going anywhere. So that's just the way the world works. Um, so don't think that you can put a machine running a really old version of Linux in a modern world. It just does not work. You not constantly need to keep up to date for reasons because we're changing. The world changes. So how do we do this? Um, we do two things. Um, we've been doing these for about a decade now. Um, Time-based releases, very important. We don't say, let's wait for these major features to come in, but we pick a period of time and we work on that. And we do tiny incremental changes all along the way. I'll 
I'll talk more about these now. So, about eight years ago, we said, let's do a release every two to three months. We just said, let's try and change our release cycle. Because we've done years between releases, and that just did not work. So it turns out he's been very, very regular, every two and a half months. Um, and it's actually shrinking now. He wants to get it to two months. So it's been about two and a half, maybe two months. Um, I don't think we can go any smaller than two months, but Lena says maybe we can. We'll see how that works. So this is how we do it. So Lena says a release. So let's say 3.1. So numbers are just numbers. They don't mean anything. They don't mean anything for features. There's no development or stable branches. Well, there's a stable branch. We'll talk more about that. But just numbers. So like we just change it to 4.0 because big numbers are hard to tell changes from smaller numbers. So like 21 to 27 doesn't seem like a big change, but 1 to 7 does. So it's just, just math. It's just psychological. So it plays the 3.1. And then all the developers, all the maintainers, throw a whole bunch of changes out for two weeks. And I'll talk more about that later. Then he does release candidate one. After that comes out, it's bug fixes only. And he does a release every week. He's doing them on Sunday evenings, his time. He lives in Oregon. Release candidate two, three, four, five, six, seven. And these are bug fixes only going to here. Um, and then when everything looks stable, everything's settled down, he usually does seven or eight releases. He'll do a new release. And then the whole cycle starts over. This is every two to three months. And this is really good. The fact that it's such a short release cycle means that we don't feel pressured to say, oh, I have this really good feature, I want to get it in now. If I miss this merge window, I can just do the next one. Or I can do the one after that. And the fact that we're regular and that enables people and companies to schedule things. They can say, oh, if I want to release a product in the fall, I know that's going to be kernel number so-and-so, so I can target my developers to make sure that code gets into by that release. And it's very regular. And this works really, really well. So we started doing this about, I think, 10 years ago now, 8 years ago. And it worked for a year, and then we realized the people were using these kernels, but what happened between these two months, three months? What happens if a bug showed up in the beginning? So we start doing stable releases. And this is what I do. So I take Linus's branch and do 3.1.1, but 2, to 3, to 4, to 5. And I do one of these releases, depending on how much I travel, about one a week. And the rules for what goes into these is it has to be in Linus's tree first. And then we can pull it into there. That way we never diverge. We don't want to have features in here that aren't in here. We don't want to have bug fixes in here that are not in there. They have to be in Linus's tree first. And that's a really good rule. So that way, when we do 3.2, I can throw this one away and keep on going. And that's very powerful. The fact that I can just, I don't have to maintain this forever is very nice. But this is how we do releases. And I keep on going. Make sense? Questions? I know it's early. Nothing? No. So, um, turns out companies build products on these stable releases. And because they do that, sometimes they want to maintain these for a long period of time. I used to work for SUSE and doing the kernel for them. Um, we based the kernel, an enterprise kernel, on one of these releases. And it turns out it was easier for me to maintain my, this kernel in the public and internal to SUSE, so we started I maintain these for long periods of time. So companies start building products on them, and we started making long-term kernels. So here's the rule now. I pick one of them a year, and I maintain it for two years. So right now, the 310 and 314 kernels are long-term. I'm maintaining them for two years. After two years, the changes don't really apply. They start to kind of fall off a plateau. So the number of changes that are made in Linus's tree really don't reflect what needs to go into these kernels. Or it takes a lot of work to get them into the kernel. So these are the kernels I maintain. Some other kernel developers maintain some long-term kernels. Ben from Debian is maintaining 3.2. He's going to do it for five years. And that's hard. That's really hard. He's already having problems. Um, it's just a lot of work. Uh, 3.0, Willie Trudeau here in Paris maintains. And he does because his company makes some embedded devices and he maintains that. But he only does like one release every year. That were just very specific bug fixes. Um, somebody from Oracle, Sasha Levin, just said he's going to maintain 3.18, just because Oracle makes their release on that. Um, and when I pick these long-term kernels, uh, we've learned over the years we can't pick them ahead of time. I can't tell the world saying, hey, 3.19 is going to be the long-term kernel. Because then all the kernel developers that work at different companies, they start throwing crap at them. <laughs> and we made that mistake in the past, and we had horrible kernels. Um, you think that developers would know better, but it turns out we don't. 
So I, I pick them after they're released. So I talk to companies, I work with them, saying what would be good based on their schedule. 310 worked out really good for Android. There's an awful lot of phones that work with 310. 314 did not work with Android, but based on this relates to release like open Chrome. All the Chromebooks were released with 314. So the next kernel, I think we'll miss, I don't know, it might be 4.1, 4.2, we'll figure that one out. Uh, but it's not going to be 4.0. Um, so we work with companies to see what happens. A lot of consumer product companies like the Android, Google people, Chrome, um, the embedded or the big enterprise kernel companies like Susan, Novell, or Susan and Red Hat. We work with them. So that's what we do. Questions? Yes. So when you maintain a kernel for three years, that means that you have an additional numbering scheme? No, I just keep going, incrementing this number. Okay. So it just keeps on showing up. Yeah. So I think I'm 3.10, I'm at 3.10.70 or something. Okay, and the, uh, the number is not changing. On the bug fixes that come in, but I still do about one, or, I still release them pretty much all at once, it makes it easier for me. So about once a week okay. they come out. Um, every once in a while I'll skip one, but it's pretty regular. And how do you make the selection of what goes in the stable region? Well, that's a good, good question. <laughs> so um, it's almost automatic. It's, um, um, so a patch, and I'll show you a little bit how we make a patch in the kernel. The maintainer for that part of the kernel puts a little tag in the patch that says this should be back for the state. So my scripts pick it up, I look at it and say, oh, this is really something that is applicable for stable. We have some really strict rules. It has to be a bug fix, it has to be under 100 lines, it has to be obvious. <laughs> like, this is obviously correct. Um, and then I have some scripts that I'll apply things, I can show you how it happens, and then I apply it to the different trees, build it, and I test them all. There's somebody in California that um, test builds all these kernels for me. Um, he has a nice, he has literally a machine in his basement <laughs> that builds all the different architectures and boots them all. Um, I wish I didn't have to rely on him when we're trying to figure out some better infrastructure. But um, he test builds them all, and other people build them. But, um, but the bug fixes have to come from the maintainers. Or the security, there's security fixes that go in that I see as part of the security team, and we'll put those in. Or they're just, yeah, or people just email. You can email and say, hey, I think this patch over here should go in. So, but it has to be only this is true. Very, very, we break that rule like maybe once every six months about it. it isn't only this is true because the trees have diverged so much that it makes more sense just to make a tiny change in the stable tree. Anything else about release? Let's talk about how we do this. So developers. So in a lot of developers, I said 3,500 last year, right? That's a lot of different developers. And they make a change to the kernel. And I'll talk about a change in a minute. Um, they make a change and then they send it on off to the owner of, the, of that file in the kernel. So the kernel has, um, we have a tree that has all the maintainers. And we have tools that can pick out who owns what file. So you send off a patch. You make a change and you send it off to the patch who owns that. We all do everything through email. So everything gets sent through email to the owner of the file or the maintainer of that file. And here's what a change looks like. So here's one from, wow, 2009. Um, it's a very, so, so we have some rules about whether, like you have one, one line summary of what the patch change does. A USB on the go, that's for the gadget devices of USB. Fix a bug, describe it, signed off by, and I'll explain that in a minute. But here's the change. All we do is we, instead of automatically dereferencing X, we check to see if X isn't null before we do that, which is nice to do. Otherwise, we would have crashed the machine. So that's a change. One simple change. So this is a patch. This is how changes get sent around. Everything is done through email. Um, it works really good through email. Email works really good because we're all in different time zones. We don't have, everybody does not have English as a native language. You can read email, respond back in a, a much more appropriate way. So then we sign off. So the owner signed off by it, on it, and then the maintainer of that subsystem, which was David Purnell at the time, he says, yes, this is good, I acknowledge it, and then I take it and I sign off on it. And this isn't something that the kernel does. So every line of code has been reviewed by at least two people. 
person who created it, and the maintainer. Or if it isn't, and sometimes if it's just the maintainer, there's it. But you can track every single line, every single change that's made to who did it and who reviewed it. So it's also, it's a very nice legal method. It's the best audited body of code. So all 19 million lines of code, you can track down to who exactly changed it. But it's also a technical thing. This is a path of blame. So if it turns out that this path was wrong, I can say, hey, Greg, David, Robert, fix it. So it's an ownership issue. It's individuals. Our names are on this. This is our companies. We happen to work for different companies. But it's an individual effort. We do not accept patches from anonymous people. You have to know who you're from. And we, you put your name on it. So this is a very, from an engineering standpoint, you take a lot of pride in it because your name and your effort is now public. So it makes you do really good work. And it also makes you take responsibility that if you agree that this was correct, you need to fix it. That's a very powerful thing. That's really how we work so well. So that signed off by is what you're agreeing to this. And it's in the Linux kernel tree. But here's what it basically summarizes. Um, you're allowed to do this, proper license, it's public. And um, I, like I said, I don't take known anonymous contributions. If I don't know you're anonymous, I can't <laughs> do it. But we, sometimes we've gotten stuff that we knew was somebody's trying to hide their name, and we can't take that. This is it. You don't have to sign over your copyright, you don't have to do anything else. You're still in your copyright, you just say, I'm allowed to contribute. It's a very powerful thing for the kernel. A lot of other projects, like OpenStack, does not have that. So let's go back. So the path. So that patch. So David reviewed that patch. He's a, he was the maintainer of the on-the-go subsystem at the time. And then he sent it off through email to the maintainer of the subsystem. I maintain USB. So I said, yes, this looks good. So all these subsystem maintainers, there's about, we list the individual maintainers. We have about 700 of them. Um, they're all listed, maybe 800 now. And then perhaps subsystem maintainers, we have about 150, I think, 100 different subsystem maintainers. Subsystem is like TTY, USB, networking, wireless. So every subsystem maintainer has a public tree on git.kernel.org, and those public trees accumulate all the patches. So it's a git tree, and every single night or day on this side, um, Linux Next gets created. Stephen Rothwell in Australia pulls all these trees together and test builds them all across all the different architectures. He does that merge, it takes him about a day to do the merge. He says a good day is six hours, a bad day is 12 hours, depending on what happens. But so that way he checks for when there's conflicts. Like sometimes in the USB subsystem, I'll change something that happens to affect the networking drivers because there's USB networking drivers. So he'll see that, hey, the networking tree and the USB tree conflicts here. And he'll email us saying there's a problem here. Or he'll email us and say something's broken. That I test built this stuff and it was broken. These subsystem trees also, when they're public, there's a machine and a developer in China that works for Intel that pulls all these things, and we call them the zero-day bot, because every, if you do a push in about 15 to 20 minutes, he will tell you, this commit and this branch at this line broke the bill, or caused a warning. It's amazing the stuff he does. He's running um, a huge, giant build farm from Intel, and um, he will test all these stuff. So every single commit that's committed to the Linux kernel is tested for build warnings, for build breakage, for architecture issues, and we run a whole bunch of static analysis tools. Um, Cochinelli, um, Julia, who I've worked with one here in Paris, has written Cochinelli, and there's a lot of scripts that have done static analysis of security problems. Every single one of those scripts is run on every single commit. Uh, there's performance tests that's run on all this stuff to see if things are regressing. Um, fast performance tests, not long performance tests. And it's amazing. So between Intel and Linux Next, um, every single change is seen and tested. So then these trees, oh, and Andrew Morton's kind of out here on his own. There's parts of the kernel that are not maintained. Some subsystems nobody really pays attention to, or some stuff that he just picks up because he reads the mailing list better than most people do. The Linux kernel mailing list um, gets about 500 emails a day. Um, every single subsystem has their own mailing list. That's where we work. Andrew, we think, is the only one who ever reads all the Linux kernel mailing list. The rest of it is just filtered. So, um, so he'll pick up the patches we forget, um, and he has a tree and it gets pulled in next. Um, sometimes he'll send them to us, but he does a really good job of picking those things up. And sometimes stuff will go directly to him that, again, we miss. So every single day. So that's how we do all that stuff. So this happens every day. Public trees, Linux Next gets built every day. 
And then when the merge window happens, the maintainers send it to Linus. Linus doesn't pull. We have to specifically say, Linus, take this part. Um, and it works out that way because sometimes things are in the next that doesn't <coughs> work. So I had, for example, one um, release, the TTY layer, a bunch of changes happened that were not good. It kept breaking, we didn't really know what was going on. In the next, it was unstable. So I said, hey, I'm going to wait this release out. We'll fix it up, and I'll send just a few bug fixes to Linus. But don't pull my tree. I'll give you this other stuff to take. And that's very powerful. So if we have a short merge window, a short time of, um, between releases, I can skip. Two months later, not a big deal. Uh, get some bug fixes, and then the other stuff goes in. So that was good. So Linus will not pull directly from next, but we have to send them individually. Then we do that for two weeks. We send all the stuff in Linus, and then the whole release cycle starts over again. We run some tests to see what ends up in Linus's tree. Ideally, it has to be in next. Um, we're doing better. I think we're like at 90% of patches that end up in Linus's tree were in next. Finding that other 10% is tough. Um, sometimes it happens during the merge window. Networking patches come in. Bug fixes come in that just get sent directly to Linus. Sometimes we have some developers that forget to push their trees publicly to so places that Next can pick them up. And sometimes we have some maintainers that weren't even in Next at all. We tracked those down and got them. Our, so it's, it's sometimes hard to guess where things came from, the way you rebase and stuff like that. That's how we do stuff. So it's getting better. I think we're on 90%. So if you look, it's a nice pyramid, right? It's a little web. Um, I graphed this a number of years ago. And it turned out to be a, a graph about the size of this green board. Um, it's a mess. <laughs> it was a huge interconnected mess, which is really, really good. Because um, it looks like, you know, these people own this, and these people own that, and that. But the best thing about the kernel is there's no absolutes. We can all modify other people's code. Meaning the network maintainer owns the code, but if I have a change for the USB stack that I think needs to go in through that, I can make changes to it. We don't absolutely own it. There's no absolute authority. Anybody can change other people's code. You don't have to, I don't have to say, I will refuse USB patches. Unless they meet my standards, if somebody else says that's good enough, they can take it around me. So it's a good thing. We can be rounded around. Which is good, because people travel, people get sick, people pass away. You need to have redundancy in this stuff. And we do. So we have really good redundancy, and we're getting better. But that being said, these people are very, very overworked. <laughs> There's a lot of that, like eight changes an hour overall. Um, There's a lot of work to keep on top of. And I'll show some numbers later about what we do. But that's what we do. Question? Yes? Um, in what um, situation do you bypass the every step so the uh, developer can scan directly to a system? Um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes this step gets skipped because, like, USB patches I'll just take directly. If the, if the owner of, like, a specific driver doesn't pay attention for a week, <coughs> then I'll take them. So we can, yeah, we can go directly through there. You see, we patches them up there. Um, but it usually, I'll, I'll usually I'll wait and see, like, uh, like, Oliver Newcomb in Germany owns, like, a number of USB drivers. If a change happens with his stuff, uh, he'll, I'll wait for him to say, yes, this is good, or yes, this is good. But it's, it's very loose. <laughs> how, how do you, uh, do you handle uh, modifications which spread all over the uh, different subsystems? That's hard. Because <laughs> That's the hard part. Um, yeah, cross-tree um, modifications is tough. We've gotten better at it. Um, so internally in the kernel, we change the API all the time. Mm -hmm. We're allowed to break the API. Our only rule in Linux kernel development is we can't break user space. And even then, we do it and you just don't notice it. But um, we can change things internally. So a lot of things, like if we want to change an API or change something, you, the best way to do it is change it so the build breaks. So it's instantly noticeable. If you change it so the runtime modification is different, it's hard to notice that you've got all the changes. So usually the best way we do it is, if this person wants to modify like all of the USB function, um, you make a new function. And then you start sending out patches to convert the individual pieces of the kernel to the new function, get them to the different subsystem maintainers, get them to Linus, make sure the whole tree is cleaned up, and then you go and remove the old function. So that's the best way to do it. Um, or like the um, VFS, the Virtual File System Core. Alvira sometimes changes things and touch all the file systems. 
And he just says, boom, I'm touching all the file systems. It makes a change across everybody. So usually, but he does so in a way that does not break the bill. Every single patch that goes into the kernel cannot break the bill. And hopefully you cannot add a warning, a build warning. We want to build clean, we want to have no warning. Um, so he goes through, and usually that makes a change, <coughs> modifies everybody, and then deletes the old API. But it's hard. That's why we have some of these trees. So um, sometimes Next shows up saying, oh, like I had a change recently to the driver core that messed with the SCSI subsystem. So James and the SCSI subsystem, uh, we had to say, okay, James, you merge the Linux first, and then I'll fix it up, and then I'll merge. Because we had to change the fix in Next, but we had some inner tree mess. So we just had to coordinate. And Next shows that up to us. And that's why we have that. It's very good. Or a Chinese guy, is it also covering all the configuration yes. possibilities? Yes, so he runs <laughs> random config ah, on the stuff. It's random, it's not all the all the possible configuration out of the uh, config stuff. That's impossible. <laughs> I mean, there are a number of configurations you build with um, <coughs> infinite. Um, he does the standard one, so we build with like a standard configuration for this architecture. Mm -hmm. And then we can do some minimal configs, and then all the configs enabled. And then after that, we start doing random configuration options. And there's some other people that do some random configuration tests. Um, but the, the build farm in China is amazing. I talked to him at the Kernel Summit last year. Every year, the subsystem maintainers would get together and have talked about our process and stuff. And he said he could handle 3,000 more trees without a problem. And I don't know what he has. <laughs> I think, um, we think he has, um, since he works for Intel, he has access to um, pre-production CPUs that they're testing out, so A modifications. And then when a, a, a CPU goes to, um, goes to production, he gets the old ones that were not sold, you know, the A modifications that had some bugs. So he has a bunch of old, well, not old hardware that you can't sell. So I don't know what he's building, but it's, it's great. Intel does a really, really good job with that. So that's a test he does automatically. We also have in-kernel tests. So um, we have a whole, you can say, make test. And it goes off and builds and does a whole bunch of stuff. And that's some functional tests. And um, we now have a maintainer for that. And she's fixing up things and um, getting all the subsystem maintainers to change and um, add new tests. So whenever we add a new system call to the kernel now, we make you, we require you to have some documentation for it, a man page, which is new. We haven't always done that. And we also require a test. So like KGBus, uh, some code that I'm adding to the kernel recently with some other developers, we came with, here's a whole test suite for the function that exercises it and makes, proves that you actually tested the kernel code. Because a lot of times we've added code to the kernel that in retrospect it's obvious nobody actually tested it. <coughs> and so now we're getting better. So we're getting a little better. We're finally growing up after 20 years. So. Yes? How long do people stay in their position, say, maintainer or subsystem maintainer or developer, for example? It depends on the person. So, um, an interesting thing is, since we're all volunteer, our hard problem is, um, what do we do if this person doesn't do a good job? <laughs> um, and sometimes it's easy, like they say, I'm quitting, I'm done with this, and I run away. Um, storage developers, traditionally the disk maintainers go crazy after five years. It, it just happens. It's like clockwork. <laughs> and they run away. And because storage is really tough. Um, so they leave and go, somebody else does it. Pulls it in. And we pull somebody else in or somebody else does that. Or sometimes I've given up subsystems. And I say, hey, Jean, you're doing a really good job for I2C. Um, do you want to maintain this whole thing? And they say yes. And they do it. Um, it, it, it ranges. It, sometimes it's new. But the interesting thing about this is, um, so I've been doing USB uh, since the late 1990s. Dave Miller has been responsible for networking since the early 1990s. Um, that's some depth of knowledge that the kernel has that no other operating system has. When you work at a big company, you work on a project for maybe five years before you move off onto something else. Um, so you lose the knowledge base of depth of things. Our operating system, Linux has something that nobody else has. As an example of that, Windows, when USB 3 came out, the Windows did a big press release saying, hey, we're all, our, our, we have some new developers, they implemented USB 3, and they rewrote the whole stack. Like, that's crazy. We have one developer, <laughs> and she <laughs> fixed it all up and beat you guys. <laughs> um, so we didn't have to rewrite the whole thing. 
Um, and it works differently that way. So um, we have the depth and the knowledge that you know, other operating systems don't have, which is really interesting. And the other interesting thing is, um, like we have somebody who started taking over the timer subsystem with working at IBM. And then he went to go on to a different job at IBM, and all of a sudden we're like, wait, no, no, your new job, you still have to give them allocation to still work on the timers. So he still had to do something else, but we had to make sure as a company that IBM would allow him to keep working on timers. He's moved around different companies, and yet he still maintains the timer subsystem after 10 years, which is good. He really knows that stuff. He knows what's going on, and he knows how to fix time issues, which is really, really tough. Um, so you move around different companies to companies, and you still do the same work, and it's a very unique thing. But um, these people are overworked. We need more of them. Um, but it depends. So, you know, getting rid of ones that aren't working well is our hard problem. We have some maintainers that are flaky. They'll show up and do some work one week and then disappear for three months. And people start complaining about it. And how do you get rid of those? And that's people issues. You can't fire somebody you're not maintaining, or you're not managing, right? Um, that's hard. And that's, that's our hardest part. It's just dealing with people. Sometimes you sit down and say, what's going on? How's this working? Um, we have one maintainer, one subsystem that is, is actually a really hard problem right now. Because he disappears, and he's not working in that subsystem anymore. They jump something else, so he doesn't have much time, and it's just it's a tough problem. But um, but you can go if you if you implement the new subsystem in the kernel, you can go from being developer to maintaining it instantly because you can own it. Um, things like that. But this is also a web of trust. So, like when I take patches from somebody, if I sign off on it, I now am responsible for it. So if you send me new code. Um, I am saying that I accept it, I will be responsible for this, and I will send it on upwards. So I, there's people that I take patches from that I don't really read the code. I just trust, ah, it's okay. I'm not, I don't trust that they got it right. I trust that they will be there in case it was wrong. And that's the important part. I trust that they will still be around. And that's a very big thing. If you're trying to send code into a, a, the kernel, you need to um, realize that that person is now having to take responsibility for that. So some parts of the kernel is very, very hard to get changes into. Networking. Networking is very hard because the developers have to trust you that you're going to be there. You add new code and all of a sudden my burden for maintaining it is higher. The networking team has a very, they have a very, um, very big thing happen. I think about five years ago, a big nasty change went into networking core that touched everything, to add some new features for some stuff. It finally got accepted. It got merged. The day after it got merged, the email address Disappeared. Nobody ever saw that person again. Nobody ever seen them before. Just disappeared. It took the networking developers six months to unwind and fix the mess. <laughs> so they are very, very hesitant to take any new patches. <laughs> you have to get trust. And this is a web of trust. This is personal relationship stuff. So I trust people that got it right. I trust that. And Linus blindly takes things from subsystem maintainers. He doesn't review all our code. He takes them based on trust that we're going to be around there to fix it up. So that's it. It's a matter of trust. It's human interaction. So we go around, we see, we travel, um, we meet each other at, at um, conferences. A lot of us subsystem maintainers who travel a lot. All I do is travel, it seems like. Um, and that's good, because we're moving really <coughs> forward to trying to increase this. But it's personal relationships. And again, it's your name, it's personally on it. So that obviously that person who disappeared, maybe that wasn't the real name. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, so let's look at numbers. So, ten to, uh, eight changes an hour is interesting. So, this is last year's worth of work uh, by quantity, not quality. Um, we don't have a way to judge quality with, with statistics, and statistics are fun to mess with. Um, so, let's look at this. So, Hartley is interesting. Um, he actually, his patches went up again this year 1,800 patches. Um, he's working on cleaning up the Comdi subsystem, which does data acquisition devices, D2A in inputs. Um, he works for a company that makes engraving systems, like they can do uh, pets, names on little tags, and they also can do tombstones, huge stone ones. So he makes, they make a product that does engraving stuff and they use this subsystem. He's going through the tree and cleaning things up. He's actually an electrical engineer by trade. He's not a programmer, but he's going through and cleaning things up, doing a really good job and fixing a lot of stuff. Yes, Sorensen works for Red Hat. 
Um, he actually works on Zen and OpenStack, but he had a wireless device that wasn't working. He took a driver and has been fixing it up. So that's his own time he's been doing that work. Uh, Malcolm is a sound developer. Lawrence is a video for Linux. Gears. Gears is good. He maintains the uh, um, 68,000 subsystem or architecture, really old Motorola chips that aren't really used anymore. But what Gears has been doing is he goes through the whole tree and has been cleaning it up. A lot of janitorial fixes. So that's the neat thing about the kernel is we can allow anybody to change anything. So there's a lot of people that go through the whole tree, they see a problem, like here's a common way that code gets misused. Let's fix it up everywhere. And that's really good. It's constantly cleaned up, constantly changed, constantly updated. Gears been going through the tree and fixing buttons up that way. You'll see a common pattern and hit it everywhere. Lars, I think, and um, Johan also has been doing that. Uh, some more sound stuff. Um, Daniel Better, um, Intel graphics, and then Takashi is sound maintainer. So he's been modifying a lot of sound drivers and doing a lot of janitorial stuff. He works with Suzo, and they see a lot of stuff. So you can go through the whole kernel, clean up a lot of stuff with janitorial patches, and it's a really, really good power thing. So this is just quantity. It shows you how productive some developers are. So let's look at signed off by. So signed off by shows reviews. So that's all I do. <laughs> all I do is read code. <laughs> um, I did that last year. That's crazy. Wow. That's David. Um, so I maintain the staging part of the kernel, which is really, really bad crappy drivers. Um, and people clean them up a lot. So there's a lot of changes there. USB, driver core, serial. A lot of other parts. David Miller maintains um, networking core, uh, IDE. He's now taking the storage driver stuff and a few other parts of the stuff that he reviews that. Mark Brown has embedded sound. So Linus takes everything. Um, and Andrew Morton is that per person sucking patches in. So you'll notice like we have more signed off by than Linus because we're sending stuff to Linus. He's just pulling it through Git and he's not actually seeing it. He's trusting us. Andrew Morton sends patches through email. So Linus sees all of Andrew's patches and signs off on them. So if you look at the difference, he actually, Linus has been reviewing a few, like about 300 patches, um, 100 patches more that. Yeah, Linus doesn't review much anymore. Maro, um, video for Linux, Daniel Better, embedded um, sound, John Lobo, wireless. So like John's wireless patches get directly pulled by David. So there's 1,700 patches that went through David more that David didn't review. Uh, Raphael is ACPI and power management. Marcel is Bluetooth. Bluetooth did a lot of changes last year. That's really weird. Um, so yeah. That kind of shows you some areas of the kernel that change a lot. And this is it. So those maintainers, those subsystem maintainers, these people. Um, David Miller said the best. Um, we're like editors now. We used to be a writer a long time ago. Now we just take other people's stuff and say, change this here, change this there. This looks good. And they take it. And every once in a while, we have a side project. So we try and stay sane by having little side projects. So I have side projects, David Miller has some, we all know. But mostly all we do is review code. We're just reading lots and lots of code. And reading code is hard. It makes you really grumpy, it makes you really upset because you see the same problems all the time. <laughs> and it's, it's a tough, thankless job. So everybody's like, why haven't you reviewed my stuff yet? I'm like, I've been on a plane. <clears throat> Questions about that? See who sponsors these people. So everybody ends up working for other companies, uh, which is great. So um, this last year we had unknown. So everybody, time you contribute to the kernel, I ask if I can't figure out who you work for. We can track, keeping track of these numbers for about eight years with Jonathan Corbett for Linux Weekly News. Um, so unknown and amateurs. Amateurs are people that don't work for anybody or they're doing it on their own time. Um, all those amateurs and unknowns are, are usually five patches or less. So the joke is, if you get five patches into the kernel, you get a job. Um, it's not really a joke. It's pretty true. <laughs> All these companies really, really want to hire people. If you want a job, get some patches in the kernel, you can get a job. There's a, a lot of stuff. Um, Intel's been really well. Red Hat, Samsung, Lenaro, Sousa, consultants that kind of lump them all together. IBM Vision. So this is Hartley, the one guy. <laughs> Got number 10 out of 400 some companies. So, I, I show this to a lot of companies. I give this talk there and say, see, one person can make a difference. <laughs> um, it's a really big thing. So that's what? 1,800 patches? Probably did. And he's number 10 out of 400 companies. This is pure quantity, but it's not. So, um, I look at numbers. So, Intel has about 80 people doing this. 
Uh, Red Hat has about 50 people. Sonar Lonaro has about 50 people. So it's numbers. You can do patches per people, kind of interesting. So Susan doesn't have as many developers as Red Hat, but yet they still do really well. Interesting. IBM keeps going down. Um, let's see what else they got. TI somehow still hangs on there. They've pretty much let go of all their kernel people. Google is good. Google, I think there's like 1,200 patches, Google. Freescale. So this is number 16 is one I like. So the kernel has um, the free and open source, what is it? Open, I can never remember. It's an intern project for women that we sponsor. It's an outreach program for women. Outreach program for women, thank you. I'm a mentor for it, I can't remember the name. Uh, they just changed their name to Outreachy. But um, these are the intern, so as part of the intern process to apply for the intern program, you have to get patches with the kernel. It teaches you how to uh, get things in, how to uh, get them accepted, how to <coughs> accept change or accept review comments and make modifications as things go. Uh, the women involved there, there's about 23, I think, last year. Um, they ended up contributing 990 patches. To the so um, they're very good. Um, all the interns that have gone through there have instantly gotten jobs or they've stayed in academia. A lot of them don't want to go to jobs. Um, my intern last year um, did really good. She deleted 200,000 lines of code from the kernel, um, which everybody's like, she's like, that's not a big deal. Like, well, you knew which ones to delete. <laughs> I was just good. Um, so they're really, really good. So this is a, a, um, a very good program that's been going on, and they're doing really good work. But they, they're contributing better than the 430 other companies. It's just one intern program. So it can, you can make a difference. Want to if your company wants you to. Um, yeah. So that's the top 20. I didn't break anything down anymore. So the way I, it makes sense for companies to contribute is um, let's see, yeah, IBM and Intel publicly said this. I'd save you time and money. It's a business reason to contribute to the kernel. Um, it's funny. So I give this talk to a lot of ARM. You'll notice if you go back, there's not very many ARM, there's a few ARM companies. Um, the embedded companies traditionally don't get code upstream. Um, Qualcomm is known for not merging stuff upstream. Um, and they'll release the chip, and then they'll release the code, and then six to eight months later, then the code gets merged, and by that time they've released two new chips. Um, Intel is so good at this. They get their code upstream and in the tree. We have to delete code for a processor that Intel never shipped. <laughs> And I, because I started getting these patches, I'm like, wait, wait, we can't delete this code. This is for a chip. I'm like, no, 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 we never shipped this. I'm like, wait, we took this like eight months ago? And like, they get code merged. Um, IBM got code merged for Power 8 processor before the chip was taped out. It's that good. IBM and Intel are that far ahead of the game. Because then they get it merged, they get it upstream, and then they get it into distributions, and they don't have to have all this stuff. It's easier to get bug fixes in when the chips actually come out or rip code out than it is to get whole new major features. They're that far ahead of everybody else. So. so does that mean that you can accept code, but you cannot run and test? Oh, I do all the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's another question. So I get stuff, as long as it looks correct, it's fine. And a lot of drivers, a lot of drivers are for, like, it only will touch this hardware. So if you have this hardware, and you say, hey, there's a driver for it, I trust you, but it works. I can't, there's no way I can test it. If you modify the USB core for your driver, I will test to make sure that the core didn't break anything. But the kernel is very broken up in a very hierarchical manner. It's very modular that way. So yeah, there's lots of things that go in there. We have no idea. Like whole chips <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> so it saves time and money. So if you have extra time and extra money, um, some companies, um, Amazon is known, does not let their employees contribute to open source. They contributed five patches last year. And the whole company is based on that. Um, that's their business decision. It's an upper management decision. Um, lower than that, wants to change it. I, I live in Seattle. I talk to these people, I badger them all the time. Um, hopefully they'll change, but um, they're getting better. Um, Intel now, pretty much their joke, or IBM, I'm oh, sorry, Amazon's joke was, we just buy six month old Intel processors and Intel's done all work for us. So, um, yeah, Intel's not too happy about that. <laughs> but they still can change. Questions about companies? So a nice thing about companies, so I used to hire at IBM and I hired at SUSE and other companies. Um, if, you work in if you work in open source, when I see your resume, I see that you can, and I look, hey, you contributed to this open source project, I can see that, yes, you do know how to program, coming out of school, I, I, I assume you know how to do that. I can see you can talk and work with others. I can see you're not crazy, which is 
good. <laughs> and it's instant, instant hire. It's usually very, very easy to get a job. So I haven't needed a resume in about 15 years because of the kind of work I've done. Um, other people don't. It's just very, if you work in the public, you can get a job, if you want a job. Um, academia is getting better and accepts some publications based on their open source contributions if you want to stay in academia. Um, but that's a harder, harder thing to do. There are some people doing good work there, but that's much harder. Um, not to say that if you're an academic, you shouldn't work on screen, you should. Because then you get to see real world applications of your stuff. Oh, any questions? Yes? So, do you have the feeling that publishing those statistics is actually working as an incentive for companies to contribute more to the kernel? Well, to let their employees contribute more. Yes, it has. But it's also let, um, you can see companies trying to gain it. Um, and that does not work with anybody. It's really obvious when they do that. Um, it does. And, and companies take the numbers a little seriously. I mean, IBM, Intel was really happy when they passed Red Hat. Um, five years ago, Intel wasn't on the top 50. Or about eight years ago. Um, and so they realized that they needed to change based on the numbers and seeing that. And they do that. So yeah, it does work. It does help a lot. Um, and some companies end up not caring. Like IBM's lost a lot of people over time. TI is losing people. But that's a business decision. AMD will disappear really soon now because they laid off all their kernel people. They now all work for Amazon and Susan. So it's just a business decision. So um, maybe they don't care. Broadcom has gone from nothing to there because now they start selling chips for the Android. NVIDIA, that is not for their graphics drivers, that's for their embedded chips. Their embedded chips is a lot of work. Well, you showed us the number of uh, changes which are being applied daily. Do you have any figures about the number of patches, lines, modified, which get rejected daily? No, it has a lot. So as anybody who's trying to get changes accepted, you realize it takes you like three or four times sometimes. So there's a lot more being rejected than there are being accepted. Um, another, another number, so the, um, interesting, so I said um, that eight changes an hour, um, people say, oh, it's all in drivers. No, it isn't. So the core of the kernel, I said, was 5%. 5% of all those changes are in the core of the kernel. It's spread uniformly across the line, doing these numbers. So drivers are 50%, 50% of changes are in drivers. 35 to 40% in architecture is in there. It's really weird, it's uniform everywhere. So we're changing the whole kernel everywhere, just at the same rate of change. Which is scary, think about that, your core kernel is changing. Um, people say, oh, Linus isn't doing any work anymore. About six months ago, Linus rewrote the basic locking primitives in our kernel. It made things faster based on new hardware. Those are things that normal companies would never touch once you get them working. You never change those again. Here you wrote. Um, so that was the core functionality of the kernel changing, and we go faster now because of that. And that's really good. So a lot of benchmarks all of a sudden sped up. A lot of things go faster because we know better. We know how some hardware works better. Core pieces keep changing. So, I want all of you guys to contribute. <laughs> so I want, um, if you want, I get a lot of questions, how to get involved. So the best thing you can do is run Linus's releases on your laptop, on your machines. I run his bleeding edge stuff on my machines uh, with my patches on top of this. Never had a problem in years. Um, every once in a while, um, you'll find a bug and you can, using Git, you can trigger, um, you can bisect things down to that problem. That's good. Run those machines on your machine, that way you'll, Get comfortable with building the kernel, comfortable with how the process works, and you'll feel good about um, the fact that you know things aren't going to really break. Um, but it also lets you let us know of problems ahead of time. If I don't, everything works for me. If it doesn't work for you, I need to know that. Oh, I don't fix it. It's that simple. So things go out and they all work on our machines, but they don't work on yours. But that's the hard thing with testing. You can't have a regression test for hardware a lot of times. We have to test them everywhere. So run the releases on your machine. If you see something odd, let us know, or fix it. Um, there's a book out there I read a long time ago and tells you how to build, download, build, boot, <coughs> install, and boot um, a kernel. It's free, it's online, you can download it. Um, so that's the whole goal of that book, is it tells you how to configure a kernel for your hardware, install it, and boot. It's a, nice, it's a small book, it's free again. Um, or you can pay for it, but I don't get any money. Um, in the kernel, I'll talk about these more in a minute in my second half of the talk. Um, but there's a how-to file. That how-to file tells you everything you ever want to know about kernel development, how the process works, which we explain in this big, long document. 
um, where to go to find information, how to make patches, how to, it basically is a list of links to other locations to read. If there's things in there that you don't, can't find or don't have an answer to, let me know and I'll add it there. It's a really, really good document. Um, development process, Jonathan Corbett from Linux Weekly News wrote this. It's a big document that explains the whole tree, how we do Linux next, how we do the releases in a much, much more detailed way. It's a really good thing. So read those things. Um, kernel newbies. It's a great website. It explains um, every, all the changes, major changes in every release. <laughs> um, there's a, a tutorial on there on how to write your first kernel patch, how to submit it, how things work that way. Um, it has an IRC channel, and there's a um, mailing list. The mailing list is very friendly. You can ask almost any question on there. Um, you don't always get the right answer, but <laughs> you can ask any question. And usually people will tell you where to go. The IRC channel is good. It's usually there's like three or 400 people in there saying nothing. Um, we just ask a question and, and people answer. The IRC channel is really good in that people in there know how to find the right people for to help answer your question if they're not in there. Um, so that works really well. I'm on there and a lot of other people are. That's a good place to start. And then it's a cute logo. Um, I'm going to give you this talk next. <laughs> I gave it a pause done a couple years ago. Um, in the you're looking for things to do. Like I said, there's jan there we call it janitorial tasks. People sweep the whole tree. Uh, we have a list of them on the Kernel Newbies site, the Kernel Janitor's list. The list is kind of old, but it's a good thing. Some things say um, strings that match this kind of thing should be made static, constant, so that they go to a different part of memory, so go through the tree and pick those up. Um, it's a good, it's a list of if you're curious and you don't know what you want to do, here's a list of the places that you can start looking into things. Um, this is a fun thing. There's a challenge out there. Um, I cannot pronounce this. Ulipta? Just Google little penguin challenge. Um, so it's a challenge for kernel programming. You um, you sign up and then you get a problem through email. You send in the you send in the change through back through email. Eventually it'll respond. It's kind of slow. I think there's 10,000 people taking it right now. Um, and then it comes back and says this is wrong and this is right. And then here's the next one. And there's 20 different um, challenges in it. Um, two of the challenges end up you get patches into the kernel. Um, a lot of them is you touch, and if you go through this thing, you end up touching almost the whole kernel tree. Uh, you touch a lot of different subsystems, networking, file systems, a driver core, um, proc, processes. Um, and the first couple challenges are pretty basic. Uh, coding styles, building things, hello world. But after that, um, it gets pretty advanced. And um, so I think 10,000 people signed up for it. Uh, only 100 have finished it. So, um, it's a pretty steep drop off rate. Um, but it does run kind of slow sometimes. But it's pretty good. It's, pretty good. it's, a, nice thing. it's a nice place to start. Um, and it works out well. It teaches you how to fix your email client so that you can actually send the patch. Basic things like that. Um, so, I maintain the driver project and the staging part of the kernel. Um, in this part of the kernel, there's a whole bunch of really, really horrible code. But in every directory, there's a to do list of why this code is in the staging directory. Why is not part of the main part of the kernel tree? And these are things that need to be fixed up in order to get it merged out. Do those. There's a list. Things you can do. Do those. A lot of them are as simple as fix the coding style. And I'll show you later how to do that. Um, it's that simple. There's a list of things you can do. A lot of times you don't have the hardware for this stuff, but it's okay. You can, you're making changes that are obviously correct. And usually there's somebody that you can, in the, in the to-do list, there's an email address of somebody who has the hardware that can test it. And that's it. Anything else? Questions? Is that USB stick somewhere? Around? You still using it? Is it done? Okay. Right when you review uh, patches and code, but you just treat the patches in the mail you receive, or do you have some tools to? You? So I'll show you right here. Here's my <laughs> mailbox. Um, yeah, well, I have my I have 1,300 emails in my to-do mailbox. Um, so here's a part of the community. I don't know why I do it in color 
source. Um, so this is part of the outreach the open source um, program, the intern application process. So here's somebody who sent me a patch saying script functions are called and don't indicate, so they should be deleted. And so I just read through it. And I read through it and say, yep, that looks good, and then I save it off and then I'll apply. So it's all done through email. So I have some scripts. Um, stable stuff, I have better scripts. Um, it's all done through emails. So I'll look at these things and say, um, so here's a stable patch. Our scripts will email me when there's a problem. Um, to add something to a stable tree, you just have to CC stable a feature, and then I trigger off that. And okay, 47 lines, that's a big patch. Um, but I trust that they got it right. <laughs> so then I can just do, one key, and I add my signed off by, and added it automatically. I applied it to 319, applied it to 314. Hey, it worked on all of them. That was easy. And I'll say, that was it for that. I just go through them. That was easy. Hey, do some work. Let me work. And then I'll build test that. So, so. Um, Is this big enough? Can everybody in the back see the font? Okay. Okay. Um, so, great. So I've given this talk in the past. Um, I've sometimes assigned files to people. That doesn't usually work out. So it's going to be up to you to pick a file. I'll show you how to do that later. Um, so. You guys know about the how-to file the process. You guys know that? Okay. So in this talk, I'm not going to tell you how to build and install a kernel. Again, go read the book. Um, it's free. I'm not going to teach you C. Hopefully, is everybody knows C? <laughs> um, the kernel is all done in C. Um, very, very little assembly language. Very little assembly language. Um, I, in the 15, 20 years I've done kernel work, I have never, ever had to write assembly language. I do drivers, touching hardware. Um, so yeah, it's all C code. Um, I've been doing C for 25 years. Um, it's a horrible, miserable language, but it's the best thing we got. And it works really, really well. Uh, it's fun, it's a fun language. It's small, it's simple, it's extremely powerful. And you can do so many things in it. Um, the kernel is written in object-oriented C. Um, I do, we've created multiple inheritance, uh, operator overloading, all these crazy things in C. Um, you, can do this, uh, you can do object oriented programming in any type of language, um, assembly language even. Um, so the, the function, the fact that we still use C is not really as outdated as I think it is. We still do modern programming for this. Um, so here's what I'm cover. Git basics. Uh, I don't think anybody's, is anybody familiar with Git? You guys have to use source code control. Some universities teach it, some universities don't teach it at all. Everything should be done with the source code control. Git is great. It's really nice. Um, coding style, talk about that, um, why we have one, what it is, fix a file, how to generate a patch, how to email a patch, and that'll be it. And then there's no reason why everybody here can't do the same thing. So, Git. Um, so, Git is good. This is Git. Um, so this is a kernel tree. Um, this is my staging tree, um, like you saw, I had apply staging patches. Um, this is the Git. So I have some, um, some small shortcuts that I use for aliases. Um, so Git branch will show you all the different branches. And branches in Git are something that you really need to learn. They're very, very powerful. They're very odd to think of in the beginning. But think of them as different, different um, lily branches of a tree. And you can work on them. But you have local branches and you have remote branches. So on the kernel.org tree, um, there's a number of branches. Oh, I have tests up there. Great. Um, so you have, I have staging Linus, staging next, staging testing, master. So master, I usually always track Linus's tree. That's a clean Linus's tree. So you need to have, a, you never work off of Linus's tree. You create a branch and work on your own. So like I work branch, work off Linus, work off Linux next. And this is what feeds into Linux's tree or the Linux next every day. 
Testing is what I use to test patches out in, and then they get merged on it. So um, I've actually accidentally pushed a few testing branches publicly. That needs to fix. But here shows all, so it shows my local ones, my remote on my personal server, my remote on get, um, get that kernel of work. So branches, different branches, and these match other ones. But Git is very powerful. So Git can do things, so you can touch a file. So, Git looked at the whole 19 million lines of code and told me home files one. Very, very fast. Um, the whole kernel tree fits in about 700 meg compressed um, very well, and then it expands out, of course, much better. But um, so Git status will show you what has not been changed, what has been changed, make file has changed. Um, Git diff will show you the diff. I changed RC3 to RC9. I think this changed the name of the kernel. <laughs> the kernel on a sheet. Um, that's it. So you get diff. We'll show you the difference that you've done. You can then commit it if you want. I'm not going to. Um, there's some, a lot of good tutorials out there on how to use Git. I'm not going to. <coughs> use them all. Um, there's a lot of really good ones now. GitHub has some really good tutorials on how to work with them. That's the basics. So um, Linus's tree was on this. USB stick. Um, Linux Next is here. Linux Next is what you should work off of if you want to do development. Because it merges all those developer trees together and it has all the stuff. A lot of people, so you have two to three months worth of work that are not in Linux's tree. You don't want to duplicate effort that other people have already done. Especially when cleaning code up. A lot of people clean code up because they say, oh look, there's a build warning. Let me fix that up. Well, other people have already done that. It's already been merged. So, um, don't do that. So work off of Linux Next. So, let's see what I, so clone, gets a clone, and you go from there. Um, git branch. Um, so git checkout branch, let's call this. Um, so I switched to a new branch. So I have a new branch called tutorial. I'm on that branch. Uh, it shows me the commit ID and shows me what thing, and it happens to be how the match I worked off my testing one. But um, so git branch or git checkout dash b tutorial. I'm going to branch. So I'm going to make a file, I'm going to make a change. I can commit this. So commit dash a, it drops you into an editor, and you say, uh, And I sign up on it. Oops. You edit it, you say it, change it. So then if I look, hit log, say I changed the version to RC9. There it is. The nice thing about branches is I didn't really want to change it. I can delete this branch and go back. But you can see, um, You can format, you can make the patches into emails. You format the patches through emails, because you're going to have to send them through emails. And here's the patch in email form of what I just did. There's a change to make file, does that, there it is. You can send this off automatically. So it gets really, really good for creating changes, sending them off through email. And I'll, I'll show you later how you can actually send things directly through email. So, again, it's a really simple thing. So let's Questions about branching commits, I went through that really, really fast. But do anybody have any basic Git questions they want to ask? Git was created by the kernel developer, Linus created it. We've been using BitKeeper for a number of years, which was created for kernel um, contributions. Um, it's really, really powerful, it works really well. Um, it turns out the world now uses it, which is really good. Um, but it's a very good distributed model. You can use it in the traditional model like CVS, where you check everything and push it to the server. But but it works really well. So, questions about Git? Anyway. All right. So, Linux next. So, um, when you have Linus's tree, you can add, 
remote add, Linux next, and this URL. <coughs> uh, if you don't have Wi-Fi, it's gonna, it'll take a while to start that. But um, these instructions are online if you, to, um, if you Google Linux next. The best thing is you add a remote um, location that you can pull from, you fetch it, you fetch the tags, and then you update it. Linux Next gets regenerated from scratch every single day, so you can't constantly pull, because it'll start merging things crazy. You have to fetch it and then check it out, fetch it and check it out. Um, it rebases itself. All the kernel trees that are on kernel.org normally do not rebase themselves. We can't go back in time and fix things up, because other people base our work on them, their work on theirs. But Linux Next is a, uh, different than that. It gets generated every day. So this is the best way to do Linux Next. Let's talk about coding style. So the kernel has a coding style. Um, I'm not saying it's the best coding style. Um, I'm used to it, so I like it a lot. Um, but the best, re the, the most important thing is that you have a coding style. When you work on a project with more than one person, even one person really, you have to have a coding style. And this is why. There's been tons of research on why you need to do this. And I'll let you guys read this. Um, it was a really big academic area for a while. Um, you can read that. That's the best summary I can do, but basically it, ma it means that your brain matters. Your brains see patterns really, really easy. And once you get used to common patterns, the patterns, <laughs> the metadata around those patterns goes away. And you can see the logic behind it very easily. If I see code and it's in the wrong formatting, my brain has to stop and think about what actually is going on. Is the, is the brace in the right spot? Where is it returning from? If it isn't there, if it's in the right formatting, that just goes away. It's automatically, your brain automatically sees the patterns for what they are and the logic for what it is. You just have to be consistent. It doesn't matter what it is, consistency is the key. So you have to pick a coding style and you have to stick with it. Uh, there's some, the GNU coding style I think is horrid, but it works. Uh, it works for those developers. Um, it, it wastes a lot of white space in some places, but it works. And that's the key. And the key is consistency. So if you ever uh, uh, submit a patch to a project, use that, patch, that project's coding style. It's there for a reason. It's very specific. It's because of the brain. So let's talk about what the kernel's coding style is. We use tabs. Sorry. <laughs> and all tabs are eight characters long. And we only allow 80 characters on a line. So think about that for a second. Eight characters for tab, eight characters for a line limit. People yell at this all the time. But we have modern editors, and we have, you know, why 148 lines characters wide? Why do this? Well, it turns out, if you start hitting the 80 character line, you're doing something wrong with your code. It's too complex. If you're hanging things way out over here, and you're going, you're nested so deep way there, you need to make a subroutine, you need to refactor the code, you need to make it simpler. Kernel code, the goal of kernel code is for other people to fix your bugs. You want other people to find your problems, you want other people to fix them. So you need to make it as simple and obvious and as it can possibly be. The kernel is very, very readable. It's one of the most readable bodies of code because of this reason. Because we don't let you wail out all the way far in the end and we bring you back. We do break this sometimes, this rule sometimes. If you have a string that you're printing on an error message that's really long, we'll let you break the 80 characters lines because it's more important for us to be able to grab for the string than it is for us to wrap the here at line. So that's okay. But 80 characters is pretty much a hard rule. And it's there for a reason. So it isn't just because we're old school, we have very narrow terminals. It's because you think we are. But <laughs> you, you think you should, you should refactor your code and you should do something different. I have broken this a lot. I've written some code that's some horrible stuff. PCI hot plug drivers, they're out there. And because to make the 80 character lines, you're doing like eight characters and you're wrapping this stuff down. And eventually I just got sick of it and I fixed it. And it made it so much easier and so much more readable. And I actually fixed the bug because of that. Because it was hiding in that mess that was, was trailing the line down the side. So you to ask, it's just a rule. But it's there for a reason. Um, okay, <coughs> braces. Like Kerning and Richie said, there and there. That's simple. <laughs> Don't put this over here, put it there. Multiple lines, you put braces for an if statement on else. Goes there, there. It's that simple. That's just where we put them. Um, they have to be there. Um, if you do a single line statement, you don't need the braces. This one drives a lot of corporations crazy. 
because they do want a brace here and they want a brace here. Um, we don't have to do this because we have good tools. We have tools that if you mess up and indent and accidentally two, do two lines through and bar below that, our static analysis tools will say, hey, you did something wrong. So we have good checking tools. Uh, we've learned to make these good checking tools because of that. So you don't have to waste the white space of uh, extra lines of the braces. Well, you only lose one line there, but um, because of that. So that's our, that's our rules. Um, again, it goes against a lot of corporate coding standards, but we work out well. They should start using our, our all our tools are open source, so they should start using them. So, questions about braces? Um, functions, it's the only time we break it. Left and right. Uh, we don't put it back out here, we put it there. Um, another thing about, uh, so you have a function name, no space, parentheses. Uh, return, no braces, or no parentheses, just return. Um, if you don't need a return, it's a void, you don't even put a return there. You just, you just fall back. Return is not a function call, that's why we don't put braces. Um, or parentheses. So that's, a, so that's really the only brace either there for a function or on the lead trailing line. We have a tool that checks all this for you. Um, check patch. Um, it's funny, sometimes I get patches that people haven't run through this tool. Um, the best was I had a 200 line driver that had 800 check patch problems. <laughs> it holds a record <laughs> uh, for how many errors per line. <laughs> Every single line had multiple errors. Um, that was interesting. I, that, that's hard to do. Um, but it, it'll run it automatically. So I'll show you this. Um, oh, I, that's what patches. Talk about that. So let's run check patch for a second. Um, you can run on a file too. Um, oh, let's pick something horrible. <coughs> Ooh, that's good. Um, yeah, lots of errors. Lines over 40 characters, space required. Um, file operation should be constant. So this is also some other logic thing there. Um, that's what it does. It'll start telling you what things are going on. Under 80 characters, space required after that closing brace. Actually, that's a little messy. Um, there's one that's over 80 characters. Things like that. So there's a tool out there to do it for you, which is good. So the Luster file system is now in the kernel tree, and it is a mess. Um, and looking at this code, it's amazing when you see enterprise code submitted for a kernel, um, how bad it really is. <laughs> um, so a number of years ago, Microsoft contributed code to the kernel for their Hyperbeat drivers, because it runs uh, Linux runs really good on Azure or their big cloud. The patches came in, uh, the original code came in at 7,000 lines of code. Not bad. Uh, it took us two years to clean it up. Um, two years later, it got merged to the proper part of the kernel tree, and it was 4,000 lines of code. And it had three new drivers associated with it. So after cleaning up the code, fixing all the coding style problems, <coughs> going through our code view problem, it got smaller, and it, and it pretty much doubled in functionality. Um, Linux kernel drivers are one-third the size of other operating system drivers because of that. Because we see common things that can be done, or you're just doing stupid things that you shouldn't be doing because we know how to do things better. Um, so, Luster code is uh, wrappers upon wrappers upon wrappers that were not needed and just need to be finally cleaned up. But here's a good, yeah, oops, it's not fine. Here's a good file. I found this last night. Yeah, nine mornings, it's not bad. Um, and then you can do strict to really be pedantic. Oh, and they 11 checks. And they'll do some other things like, yeah, it really should compare to nulls be written a different way. Um, sometimes we don't agree with these, but 
Also, blank lines wouldn't be nice. You can clean up your stuff. You know, we have checks for all those kind of things. Um, these are run again all the time on this code. Um, when you check code into the tree, the zero day bot will run check cache stuff on it. Um, I don't let it run on the staging tree because it just would be a mess. Um, the staging tree is there. Um, we don't. I don't go through and just clean these up because it's there for other people to get involved in the kernel. So you can clean these up. Set them easy. So anyway, that was good. So get diff. I did most of these. Get show format patch. Send email. All right, let's do this. Right. Um, is there any check to uh, capture the if condition, which is? Uh, Omitted and uh, where you get an, uh, an assignment and instead of a, of a test, uh, you get an equal or instead of an equal equal? Yes, actually, the compiler tests for that. The GCC will give you a warning for that. Okay. Unless you have to cast it away explicitly. So, GCC, we make sure all the build tests, all the warnings go away. So, let's edit this file and make a change. I don't So I'm going to fix this one line that says um, you shouldn't put a space between a function name and its parameters. It's simple. Um, there it is. So edit this Let's change one more. That needs to go away. Uh, my editor is nice. Skip will integrate with your editor. It shows, hey, you changed one line. So if you that fast, then your editor can pick that up. This is Vim, so there's some plugins for Vim and Emacs to do that. But it works really well, so it'll show you that one line has changed. I don't know why it's, oh, it's black because my normal default is black. Um, yeah, so I changed one line. So you get status to show you changed one line. Um, ideally, you would make the driver to make sure. <laughs> make sure I didn't break anything. Yes, still go. So if you make it, you can make just a directory, make m equals and a subdirectory, or you can just make the whole tree. Um, it's good to do. Um, I get a lot of patches that obviously were never test built. Um, that's bad. That wastes my time as a reviewer, because then I have to commit them and I have to back things out. Always test build your patches. So it's good. So what do we do now? So we made a change, so let's commit. So the change was we leave the space. So we are in the staging cluster. Um, fix. This patch. Always have to say something. Um, make sure you sign off on it. And then you commit it. And that's it. So I committed it so I can see. It shows I was the author, the date was now, signed off by, and did one thing. So that's it. So you can now, like I showed before, you can generate a patch. So format patch was generated in a patch format. And there it is in patch format. So now what do we do with this? How do we get it to where it needs to go? So we have a tool. Like I said, every part of the kernel has its maintainer. So we have a tool called scripts get maintainer. Obviously. <coughs> we run a patch. It'll turn away for a second. So it looks at the git history of files. And it's noisy. I would turn on noisy. OK, so it says Olog and Andreas are the maintainers of the Luster subsystem. I, Greg, am I the maintainer of the staging subsystem. And then we start getting people oh. Keith did the change, John did the change, Richard, my uh, And there's a mailing list that you might want to copy. Another mailing list you should copy for the staging subsystem and curl.org defaults to everybody. So this tool will then tell you who to change things to. There's a way to make it spit it out in a little nicer format, which I can't remember at the moment. Um, but it's good. The bad part about this is, if you touch a file in the kernel, you're it. <laughs> so the joke is nobody wants to touch the floppy driver. Then all of a sudden they get all the emails and all the patches for it. Um, nobody wants to maintain some stuff. So if I like I'm not, if you maintain a, if you touch a common file, you end up starting getting lots of emails for patches 
for that file. And that's just part of it. So I, I really doubt that Mike and James and Richard and Keith care about patches because they just did one patch and they blew on by for that file. But that's the way it works. So, so then you can pick these people and um, ideally... Um, so now, so now we need to send this patch up. So Git has a tool that does that. Send email. Um, send it to myself. I'll send it to Olog. And there's a better way to do this. I can't remember, but you can do it by hand, it's fine. Send it to Andreas. And I'll send it to mailing list. Um, I'll just hit one mail on this right now. I'll do. So get send mail to me or like a copy of mailing list. And that's it. And oh, I need some good bumming. Get send mail will ask you, here's the patch. <coughs> Here's who I think I'm going to send it to. Is this correct? It gives you a chance to back out. Um, send this email. <coughs> I'm only sending one. You can send it on a whole bunch of them. If you send it on, you send it on a whole bunch of them, it'll correctly thread things properly. They can let you compose a cover letter if you're sending multiple patches at once. Um, automatically in your editor, and it's a really, really powerful tool. Um, Get send mail is based on some old scripts that I have um, that I used to write that send out patches so much. Um, but it's a really nice thing. So send this. Email, yes. And boom, it's sent. It says it hit my mail server and it went out. Yep, one more. In five minutes, I'll check that it actually got there. My email server only went every five minutes. Um, that's it. Wow. And so, how do you know your patch has been accepted? So that's, that's an interesting question. So um, sometimes when you send a patch out, you instantly want response. Right? I send it. Maintainers are completely overworked. <laughs> um, if it's the middle of the merge window, like I said, the merge window is for the maintainers to send stuff to Linux. It's not for you to send stuff to Linux or you to send stuff to maintainers. Maintainers will queue things up in their inbox for it to be applied after the merge window is closed. Um, so there's a two-week window there where I can't touch any patches from community, except bug fixes. Um, so after that, then it takes me usually three to four more weeks to catch up on the backlog that was from there before I was traveling. So usually the, the good rule of thumb is uh, wait, two, wait a week, wait two weeks, if no way responds to it, then send it again. You're not being pushy, you're not being rude by sending it again. Um, or just say, hey, did you get it? Well, don't send it, just send, resend it. Um, sometimes, I mean, I feel bad if I haven't responded in time, sometimes I'll just ignore your pings and I'll eventually get to your patch. Um, when I apply a patch, you, um, my scripts um, will report, will send to you an email saying it was applied, here's where it was applied to, here's what's going to happen next. Um, some maintainers, Andrew Morton, um, send up to, and that were, some people just write back saying, applied, thanks. Some maintainers. But um, I think very few maintainers now accept things without telling you they accepted it. You can usually check their public trees, but it usually, at least, we're always responsive. We'll say so. We'll wait a couple of weeks. We're all busy. And especially if you're sending in code cleanup patches, those usually fall to the bottom of my list of importance. I will get to them within the next kernel merge window, so I'll get to them within two months, but um, they're usually at the bottom of my list. And whenever you reject one, is there any feedback? Yes, if I reject it, I definitely I will respond to you saying, here's the problem, why, why I didn't take this, and here's what happened to it. So let me sync my email and see if it shows up. Um, I my email server only syncs every five minutes. But it'll show up on the mailing list, it'll show up um, on my inbox, and then I can apply. Um, 
and I can show you how I apply it and what what steps involved as well. Questions? This is really really fast. You got your. Anything about kernel development? I think this is the end of my talk. Send email, maintain your checklist. Okay, here's the things. There's a good checklist in the how to. Um, make sure it builds, correct from address, sometimes you get it wrong, concise subject, explain it, and you just sign off live. I have a big form letter that if you get any of these things wrong, will just spit back at you, saying, hey, why things are wrong. I've had talks on all the things, all the bad patches that get sent to me. Um, you can send patches to me and don't tell me what order to apply them in. You can send patches and they don't even apply to my tree. They break the build. They obviously never been tested. Um, don't do those things. Make sure they're at least built. Background uh, newbies, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, fast talk. <coughs> Cover parts of this work. Questions? Concerns? Any kernel question? Anything you guys want? Yes, sir. So, I was amazed. I was told uh, French students do not come to class on time. That everybody leaves the town. It leaves the city of France. Thank you. <laughs> so there is no way to some test along uh, patches. That's good. Um, for example, if I am adding a new system four, mm -hmm. I don't know whether I can do that as contributor. But, uh, do I have to send a uh, Test along and, uh, so yes, new system calls, is, you should add a new test. But where are they um, stored in a bunch of numbers in the kernel factory? Tools, ah, okay. um, testing, self-test. Mm -hmm. All the self-tests. Um, yeah, IPC, MMFD, MMFD is a new system call we added. Um, anonymous lot memory mm -hmm. file handles that you can pass around, which is really good. Um, that's a new system call I got out, and there's test for it. Um, and there's the test for it. And there's instructions on how to build all the tests and run them. Um, RCU torture, this test will take a day to run. So you don't want to run that. That one spins up a whole bunch of KVM virtual machines, hammers on them. And does because RCU is a recopy update. It's the way we do locking in the kernel really well, and it just uh, it abuses the subsystems and hounds on them, and uses some kernel modules even to do that in order to find all the bugs that we've known over the years, all the corner cases. And Paul McKenney, who wrote um, RCU to, uh, the RCU subsystem, uh, whenever he has a bug, he tries to add another test to that so that it'll never crop up again. Uh, but that's a you run it once a day. <laughs> Don't run that obviously. Well, these other ones, the goal is to have. I think everything will run. All the tests will run locally within a uh, minute. So it's, it's just a functional test. There's a Linux testing project, which does a lot of more functional testing. Um, a lot of the kernel developers don't like that because most of the bugs that are found through that are bugs in the tests. Um, yeah, They add some things like you're going to a new machine that will go faster and break some timing thing at the testing script. Uh, we're starting to pick more of the good tests out of the testing project and put them in here. And that's good. Um, CPU hot plug is interesting. Um, all CPUs can be dynamically hot added and removed. And it turns out doing that stresses some really core parts of the kernel. So um, running that is a lot of people starting to run that just on any time they change anything in the kernel in general, like reference counting and other stuff, because that one shows up all the bugs that we can have. Um, Onlining and offlining a CPU. Um, everybody has multiple bus servers these days, so you can do that for anything. Um, it works really well. Firmware. Oh, test the firmware interface. Yeah, one other question. Yes. Uh, I ran the uh, tools. I was looking at something. I think it's located on the tools, which is hard or small or something like that. And, <coughs> which is something, uh, I think it's a, a process which tries to still to use a lot of CPU without being discovered as being uh, one term that's being using CPU by stopping just before the uh, clock tick. 
And I'm, I just tried it and I did not get the expected the result. And so one of the questions is how can we find whether the information which is for there is uh, too old? Uh, did apply maybe two or three years ago and, and see why. The only way I guess is to ask for the mailing list. Ask for the mailing list, ask the developers that um, did the code. So I mean you can, like I said, get maintainer will show you exactly who did what. Um, you can run um, this is good get plain. It shows you who modified this line last. Mm -hmm. okay. So you can break it down and what the commit ID was for that line and a little short thing. Um, so good blame is really good to find out who did what. Um, so yeah, just that. Um, there is documentation in the kernel directory. Sometimes it's old, sometimes it's up to date. You don't know <coughs> what it is. Um, I have written documentation in there that I know nobody reads. I've written documentation in there that says if you don't do this, I now get to publicly make fun of you on the kernel mailing list if you don't do that. And so about every couple of months I get to publicly make fun of somebody. Um, it's a, it's a trade-off. People, you write documentation and then it gets old or people don't read it and then some people do. So, um, but the code, I mean, since all our code is open, it's all there, that's the best thing to look at. Um, trying to cheat the scheduler, we change the scheduler and how things are at atomic are allocated all the time. So <coughs> We might have changed the functionality to make it better and it just won't work anymore. That's, that's very platform specific and I wouldn't mess with that. So here's my batch. Yeah. Came from the mailing list. So I'll apply it. So I'll show you how I apply this. So same things off to a separate mail, mailbox. Um, Um, so I try and see if it actually does apply. I'll patch this to the it. And then it does, because I said it was good. I'll usually queue up a bunch of these at once. So let's Here's two batches, mine, and then one from Christina, who fixes the check batch warning. The pact is preferred over not pact. So it looks right. I'll read it. And again, patterns match in, in your brain matters. It applies. So get, apply, mailbox, sign off, and the mailbox. So it applies to things. I will build test it. Make sure nobody broke it. Um, change the header file on that one driver to a whole driver of rebuilds. And it succeeded. Um, so I am on a testing branch. Um, so I will push this to another public testing branch, and I have a script that's Name do, that's I don't know. <laughs> but what this set, what this script does is it um that was horrible. I parse emails and bash. Um, <laughs> um what I do is I um check out this branch, uh, I take the branch, we're testing, I merge it to here, and then I push it publicly. And then I push it back and I send out an email based on every patch. There's some old patches in this directory. Do you still want to do this because it will delete them? I say yes. It sends an email out, and then I push to kernel.org, and it's going to fail, hopefully.
boom, it failed. <laughs> so, Kernel.org, we have two factor authentication to get on our public tree. So, a few of us, um, Linus, me, and some other core kernel developers, and actually anybody who wants, who has an account on there, can get this. So, it takes two, it takes oh, not only my password, but I have to authenticate this IP address, is really me through a um, you can use a security dongle or a program on your phone. And in order to get this IP address to do that, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, but that means I can't push the kernel.org, which is good. You want to have a two vector on these kernel, on these things that we release. It won't let me just push them randomly. Which is actually good. We used to just trigger off of IP addresses where they are in the geography. So um, the system in from kernel.org would see me popping up in another place in the world and email me, are you really in Paris? Yes, I am. So I used to joke, the only two people in the world that knew where I was all the time was my wife and the criminal works with me. <laughs> so now Constantine, the criminal works with me, doesn't have to care where I am because I have tools that are um, But then that email out, that sent out an email, scroll up, that sent out, so I sent out an email for mine and I sent out an email saying it went to somebody else too. So that'll be triggered out. So that will be the email in another minute I can sync up with that. And it'll show that it actually got there. So it's public, and um, the branch goes back to my testing, and it's public. So it says it's, I'm now two ahead of kernel.org because I haven't publicly pushed up, which is fine. And then once that gets to kernel.org, a zero day bot instantly sucks them in, it will test them. And I don't want to break it. Yeah, so I guess many of the students in the room will have used GitHub to interact with other uh, yes. software projects. So I think it might be useful if you could comment on why you do things this way over email with GitAM instead of using something which is more like pull GitHub. requests. Um, GitHub does not scale. GitHub will not scale past 20 developers. Um, and 20 developers is even tough. Um, email scales really, really well. I can apply 100 patches in email and something like that and push them out from different people. If I have to click through 100 GitHub um, pull requests, seeing them, I can't see the white space properly, I can't run tests on them locally, um, I can pull into a local branch and then push it back out, it's very difficult. Um, GitHub just does not scale for a project of our size. Nothing is as big as we are. I mean, you look at big projects, they do not use GitHub. Docker right now is a huge project. Um, it's on GitHub and they're having massive scaling problems. I've been working with the Docker developers on how they can fix them because they're relying on GitHub, and they're now starting to do more like, they just suck local trees locally, run manually command line tools, which are very, very powerful, and scripts you can write um, with them easier, and then they push things out back and say, yes, I applied this one. Um, GitHub also doesn't let you see um, things for different subsystems, like, see, I only care about USB, right? And as Docker, as a project, you have to see all the issues for all the different things. You can tag them differently, but you can't filter very easily. It just does not scale for large projects. Small projects, GitHub's great. I use GitHub for a lot of my small, all my user space tools that I have. Um, all of these presentations are all on GitHub. I have like 30 different ones. I'm working on um, some work for Google on a phone that they're doing. It's a new hardware bus, and all our code is public on GitHub there. Um, but there's only like five developers, maybe 10. Um, and that works really well. So anything that you use, I re really, really recommend GitHub. Um, but again, the kernel just can't. That. I mean, they change an hour, there's no way. Um, GitHub has a mirror of the kernel, uh, uh, our source, so if you want to use it and work with it from there, that's great. Um, but just don't send us pull requests because we'll just ignore it or laugh. It just does not work. Um. Here's a patch. So here it is the patch saying, or the email you got from, well, that is sent to Christina and me saying, I applied the patch, saying that, to staging tree at that location. This branch will show up the next release in the next, next 24 hours. We merged to the next one after that, after passes and testing. <coughs> and here's the patch. And also,
So this is the type of email you'll get. Andrew Morton's looks much like this. I copied Andrew's scripts. Uh, some other maintainers will do that. Um, some other maintainers will um, be a little more thorough than me. For every patch they apply, they run a whole bunch of checks. They test before and after. They have automatic scripts. This is if you add compiler warnings and whatnot. I do that by hand. They'll run um, static analysis tools on every patch. Um, they, they're a little bit more thorough and some of this stuff. For staging, these things, I don't really care. If it builds, I'm happy. Um, that's about it. But, um, other maintainers for other subsystems are much more thorough. Everybody can send me patches. There's no excuse. Um, I have sometimes given them, here's a file for you, and you're going to clean this up. But um, that doesn't usually work. Pick a file. Um, the staging directory is good. Luster directory is horrible. Um, there's lots and lots of stuff going up in there. Um, get your feet wet by sending in a basic check patch. A basic, oh, I fixed up a space issue. Um, the best thing to do is, because then in sending this, you have to learn how to use Git. You have to learn how to set up your email client, you have to set up get send mail, you have to learn all these basic things that then you can then start working on real things. Like unwinding, there's like four levels of indirection in this file system that all need to be unwound. There's macros in there that do not need to be macros. There's wrappers around common kernel functions that don't need to be wrappers. Um, there's a lot of horrible stuff in there. Um, but it was written for a multi, it was written for operating system, multiple operating systems. And now it's just back to one. So we get to rip out all the players. There's other drivers in there that are bad. Yeah. Um, this driver, this wireless driver is really bad. Um, this company is known for dropping whole new drivers on it with a whole wireless stack within the driver. So you can't use the internal wireless stacks. They have their own. Um, those are all getting rewritten. And people look at these staging drivers and they go write a new driver from scratch. And then we delete this driver. So you'll clean up a whole bunch of code in here and then two kernel releases later it'll be deleted. Your name is still in there. And questions. So um, people make fun of the staging directory because it's there, like this, these white space changes, but it is important. There are a number of kernel maintainers and subsystem maintainers that started here. It is not, a, it is there. Um, I support it. Um, I do it. So don't bother core parts of the kernel with cleanup fixes like this. A lot of subsystems don't want to see this. It bothers them and messes with their code. The SCSI subsystem has some horrible, horrible looking old code that nobody touches and nobody wants to touch. Don't try and clean it up. They'll just reject your patches. Um, clean up things in the staging directory. I'll take them to staging, I'll take them in USB. USB should be pretty clean by now. Um, a, a university in um, Bucharest just had a, this type of workshop with this type of um, talk last weekend and they cleaned up a bunch of patches in their driver clock. They sent me 12 patches. I was like, what just happened? Um, they said there's a workshop, so they cleaned up there. But that's it now, it's clean. So what do. Anything else? Yes. Uh, if, you, if you have some scripts uh, which are able to detect some uh, coding style errors, why don't you correct them? I could. I could correct, I could clean up the whole staging directory tomorrow. But my goal is it's there for people to get their feet wet. Um, yes, I could do that. I could, we have, the guy who wrote the, um, the check patch tool, he has a script that will take them and automatically create patches and commit them to the tree based on the rules. Um, I rejected that. I wouldn't take that because I don't want to see those happening. Um, that just gets, um, it gets fun. You don't want to write scripts that create patches. We all have, but um, it's not good. But it's there, it's there just for people to get their feet wet and get involved. And then they can learn what things are, they get interested, oh look, this is wireless, oh look, I can write a real driver for this hardware, and they go off and do that. It gets people involved. Again, other people in the subsystem. Um, some people may start maintaining those drivers, and they're like that, and then they get a job and they disappear, and somebody else does it, which is fine. But um, people got jobs from there, people are now subsystem maintainers, we got them done. So it's a, it's a learning, it's a place to play. So that when you were in a uh, check tool, then you get your fix done automatically. So that you yeah, well, you could, yes, you should run it on your own code. Before, if you're, if you're submitting new code to the real yeah. part of the kernel tree, it should be check patch clean. It should not be. Yeah, but rather than doing it manually, 
your ear, you could give the tools so that uh, maybe uh, uh, errors or mistakes you made uh, would be automatically corrected. Yeah, you could. You can, it's on the mailing list. You can go dig okay. it out. I, I don't want to give it away. Okay. Um, yeah. I would rather have you, by manually having to yeah. fix up the code, learn the coding style. <laughs> um, we get a lot of code. So the staging director gets a lot of like legacy code or code that comes from companies that's behind the firewall and finally gets released. So converting those developers into real kernel developers and become part of our community is my goal. Okay. And then they do that. But yeah, they, can, they, they, they should do it on their own anyway. It's not hard. More um, coding style lists, a bunch of other things. We're getting over the years, we've gotten a little more pedantic. We get more, where do you put the, this phrase, or where do you put the semicolon, or this, things like that? Or, oh, an extra space, extra blank line needs to go there, just because people. If you look, some subsystems have a little different coding style than other subsystems. Networking does things a little bit differently than others, but that's just over time. We You have a side uh, currently a, a way to track uh, issues, tickets, or whatever. Or so we have bugzilla.kernel.org. Um, a number of us don't use it. I <coughs> um, use it on the mailing list. The problem with bugzilla is it assigns it to a specific person. So like I get all the USB bugs. Um, I'm not the only USB developer by far. In fact, I don't do much USB development anymore. I just take patches from other people. So I tell people send it to the mailing list. So send your problems to mail and list the developers there well. Um, some subsystems like ACPI really use the bug tool tracking thing because they have a whole bunch of developers. They all have to work for Intel. They're used to that model. And then they track them and flow them and they pass them to individual developers and do that. Um, so you can always create a bug there and see what happens. Because um, if, if you create a bug for USB, I will email you on that thing that says send it to this company. Um, but some subsystems do that. But so yeah, so it's all on the mailing. Mailing list is the best way to do it. And just pass it around. Say, hey, this is the problem. And, we'll... and sometimes they'll say, hey, this is the problem with this old kernel. I'm like, great, I can't go back in time. Use a new kernel if it's still there or not. Um, don't use a vendor kernel. Vendor kernels are patched really, really badly. Or with all sorts of weird things that we don't know. It's like the enterprise kernels look like an old kernel version that they have. 10,000 patches added to it. So it's really a system kernel. So talk to them. If you have a Red Hat kernel and you're stuck with that and you have problems with it, Talk to Red Hat because you're paying them. You're paying them for support. So somebody's forcing you to, you're paying somebody to stick to that version and get support from them. There's nothing the community can do for that. Yeah, and, uh, and as in the beginning, everything's on GitHub, Greg Cage, there's a couple, there's a bunch of presentations there. Um, free to copy. Creative Commons license, this one doesn't have it on the bill. Okay. No more questions? No more questions. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Well, thank you. I'm in Paris for two months, so if you have any questions, you can always see that. This was recorded, I don't know what you guys can do with <laughs> I think I'm giving the same first talk like six different times in Paris for the next two months.